Welcome back to the Pastor Study. I'm Pastor Seth. This is my wife, Jennifer. This week we're discussing Chapter 5 of Grace Alone. No. Oh, sorry, of Christ Alone. Yes. <laughs> this week we are discussing the, the three offices of Jesus Christ. Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. It's a little weird to wrangle with this topic because I've had it, I've heard it my whole life. But uh, it's very important to understanding what Jesus does for us. The book divides itself into, well, this chapter, three headings, prophet, priest, and king, and asks, what is a prophet? What does a prophet do? So a prophet is someone who brings God's word to the people. Uh, God makes himself known to us in many, many ways. But to get the real, authentic stamp, you need the Word of God. Because we, being humans, have a tendency to misunderstand things. It's not necessarily sin. We're limited. Our experience is limited. But we need to remember that there's a lot more to God than our personal experience teaches us. In the Old Testament, they had the law written down, but they... They needed help understanding the law. And specifically, they needed to know when God was going to judge them for whenever they broke the law. Think of King David and the prophet Nathaniel. Nathan. Nathan. Yes. Sorry. He preached on Nathaniel this week, so... <laughs> David knew the law. Mm -hmm. He knew he broke the law. Mm -hmm. He thought he could get away with it. Mm -mm. Until the prophet Nathan brought the word of the Lord to King David. King David, to his credit, repented immediately. So we need prophets like Nathan or Amos or Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the prophets in the Old Testament to be giving us God's word. God's word doesn't change, but since we are changing, we constantly need God's word fed back to us to keep us on the path. So, for example, the law that came through Moses has a large emphasis on taking care of the poor and the less fortunate than yourselves. Throughout the prophets, you find the prophets coming to um, the people of Israel and being like, Look, you're letting your brothers starve while you're over here in houses of stone, and you think I'm happy with a few bowls on my altar, we have a misunderstanding here. I'm stating this very mildly. <laughs> and there will be consequences if it won't get fixed. Um, that was the prophet's job. Now, prophets weren't always criticizing. They were also encouraging. Like when Hezekiah was facing the armies of Sennacherib all the way around Jerusalem, and he's praying to God, God isn't answering Hezekiah personally. God sends Isaiah to Hezekiah to say, I've heard you, and I'm going to show you a great work of deliverance. What Hezekiah needed to hear to stand strong and wait for God. There's some common misconceptions about prophets. Probably the most common misconception is that prophets are somehow predicting the future or God is, through the prophets, telling them what's going to happen in the future. Uh, as if they're an oracle or has some sort of mystical power. That never happens. Yes, prophets give warnings about what's going to happen in the future, mm -hmm. but they're not predicting some amazing, unbelievable event. They're just saying, this course of action is going to have this kind of consequence. In much the same way that when I see the sun go down tonight, I can say the sun is going to rise tomorrow. So how would you address the Messianic prophecies then, for example? The Bible begins with Messianic prophecies. God is always giving a promise that he's going to send his image to take care of his creation. In the first two chapters, that promise is through Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They fail. At the end of chapter 3, God gives the promise of a son being born of Eve who will crush the serpent. All right. So when the prophets 
bring the message of, look, you're messing up. God's going to punish you. But don't worry, God's going to redeem you when your punishment is done. They're also always pointing back to the son that is promised, who's going to put a final end to the problem of our sin. Each prophet adds more details to the messianic promise. So, and that's, that's how we need to look at these. They're not prophecies, they're promises. They're not predicting that at some point in time, some Messiah is going to come. They're promising that at some point in time, God's Messiah is going to come. Much the same way that I can promise that December 24th of 2021, I'm going to give presents to my daughter. <laughs> I, it's not because I have some amazing ability to look into the future. It's because I know how time works. And you Prophet, know yourself. Prophet, and I know myself. Prophets understand how God's time works. They understand God. And they're bringing that word to a people who don't understand God, who don't understand how God works. It might seem like magic to a people who are lost in darkness when they finally see light for the first time, but it's not. <laughs> this is God's orderly way of doing justice and love and mercy and kindness. So how does Christ fulfill our prophetic office? Well, one, he fulfills the promises mm -hmm. that the prophets gave. Um, there's something like 480 messianic <laughs> prophecies in the Old Testament, and he fulfills all of them? Before we go too far down this path. I was just going to put a period there. Okay. This is how we are able to identify true prophets and false prophets. Yes. False prophets are constantly trying to predict the future. Anyone who's going to tell you that a certain result's going to happen because God told them is probably lying. 99.99999% of the time, it's they're either outright lying or it's a false spirit that's whispering in their ear. Or they just really, 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 really want that income and they've worked themselves up to believe that God said it. <laughs> True prophets are always pointing back to God's word. We no longer need new prophecies. Jesus is the final word. We don't need to... We still need God's word in our lives. We still need to learn and grow in that word. We need to know God. But there is no more new word from God. Nothing can transcend Jesus Christ. Hence Christ alone. We don't need more promises from God because we have received the last promise from God. We received Jesus Christ and we have the promise that he's going to return. No other prophecies are necessary. We just need to remember God's promise. True prophets remind us of God's promise. False prophets give prophecies about the future. Strong statement. <laughs> Strongly felt. <laughs> All right. But getting back to Christ fulfilling yes. the role of prophet. The role of the prophet was to make sure people understood God. We are very good at misunderstanding God. When Christ came... He was what the Apostle calls the image of the invisible God. Basically saying, look, the law that you have, that's fulfilled in me. What I'm telling you to do, that's what you should have been doing all along. I am God, Christ said. And so, when we look at him, when we see what he does, what he expects, where he goes, and what his ultimate aim is, that is God. In Christ, we see a perfect picture of what God has been doing all along. From his control of nature, turning water into wine, walking on water, all that stuff, to his intent to pour himself out so that people can be connected with God and truly live. Because if you think about it, we have always been living off of God's grace. God has always been pouring himself into creation so that we can live. If God withdraws his thought from us, says, I think, Job and one of the Psalms, <laughs> then we all just cease to exist. Yeah. It's by monumental, monumental, uh, divine effort that we exist. And Christ did the same thing. So when we look at Jesus, we see God 
as he's meant to be seen. And that makes Christ the ultimate prophet because he is revealing what God is, who God is, and what God wants in its highest form. Moses is said to have walked with God as, and is said to have talked with God face to face. Mm -hmm. From the Bible, we know that Moses even saw the back of God. That is amazing. <laughs> no other human being has been able to do that. What does that even mean? <laughs> But Moses can't compare with Jesus Christ, who is fully human and fully God. Moses saw Jesus' back. We get to see Jesus face to face. We have an incredibly honored position that we should be grateful and humble for, because Jesus is the ultimate prophet that Moses was pointing towards in the law, and what all the prophets were pointing towards in the law as well. All right. Priest? Priest. All right. So what is a priest's job? <laughs> In the Old Testament, priests had many functions. The most obvious one is offering sacrifices and leading worship in the temple. The priests and the Levites were specifically appointed by God to do this, to maintain the covenant between God and Israel. Sacrifices have a lot of purposes. They can demonstrate gratitude. They can um, atone for the sins of the nation. They can uh, demonstrate repentance and seek atonement for the sins of an individual. And there were just seasonal sacrifices that people yeah. made to kind of distribute the wealth and celebrate God's providence as well. And the priests were responsible for directing all of this, for killing the animals, for making sure it happened. Uh, they were also responsible for the... Um... So in the book, our author focuses mostly on making sacrifices for the atonement of sins. Because we're focusing on Christ's redemptive work, which goes through the cross. But that was just a very important job for the priests. Oh, absolutely. But they had other functions as well. Not only are they making sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, they are offering up the prayers of the people. To God. This was often symbolized in making a, a sacrifice or offering up incense, mm -hmm. but their role was to bring the, the word of the people into God's heavenly throne. Prophets brought the word of God to the people, priests brought the word of the people to God. Now because of that, they're part of that intermediary step, mm -hmm. not only are the offering sacrifices for atonement and offering up prayers. They're also making sure that the law is functioning the way it's supposed to be. So a wonderful example is that when a person wants to make a thank offering to God, if they're sacrificing, let's say, a bull, mm -hmm. now the law says that meat has to be eaten before the next day. Right. Now, as most of you know, there's a lot of meat on a bull. <laughs> Probably more meat than one, it's obviously more meat than what one person can do. Probably more meat than what the family can do. So, what are you going to do with all the leftover meat? Well, you make sure you, you make sure that it gets eaten by sharing it with the poor and the needy of the area. In times of famine, one part of the country might not have enough food, whereas another part of the country might be experiencing a bumper crop. Part of the priestly role was to make sure that the excess in one area got moved over to the want in another area. At least that's how it was supposed to work. <laughs> Unfortunately, priests, being sinful human beings, were often tempted to keep some for, their, for themselves. To accumulate. Mm -hmm. And you see this. God calls people out for it throughout yeah. the Old Testament. It's like, Prime it's example would be Eli's sons. Yeah. Eli was a powerful judge and priest of God's people. His sons were corrupt, uh, greedy. They would come and take parts of the sacrifice yeah. that didn't rightfully belong to them. Taking advantage of the women that would come to the temple. Full spectrum of human depravity on display by the sons of the most holy person in Israel at that time. 
By the people charged with maintaining the sanctuary of God and yeah. his people. Yikes. Thankfully, well, God steps in where humans fail, and Jesus Christ is the perfect priest who not only makes the perfect sacrifice for our sins, the one sacrifice that is sufficient for all time and all people and all places, he's also offering up our prayers to God in a way that no other human can do. Because Jesus is fully human and fully God, and he's in heaven, whereas priests just have to do the best they can by burning some incense. Jesus is in the throne room. He is the king. Of course he's going to listen to himself <laughs> on our behalf. This casts um, an interesting light on a lot of Jesus' miracles. For instance, the feeding of the 5,000 or the wedding feast at Cana is part of Christ's priestly duty, priestly duties to make sure there's enough to go around. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what he does. And he's anticipating that people will ask, at least later in this ministry, <laughs> you see him anticipating, I know what I'm going to do. Just yeah. ask me. Ask me. And that's a wonderful example. Priests are also the people you call when you're sick. Mm -hmm. They're going to come and provide you the instruction you need to, I mean, we might see, basically they were doctors. Diagnose, prescribe. Yeah. And when you're healthy, you went back to the priest and they gave you a clean bill of health. See that with leprosy, most noted. Mm -hmm. They would go show themselves to the priests. Uh, Jesus flatly says. Yep. And so Jesus is the perfect priest who perfectly heals his people. I came to call not the healthy, but the sick. Yep. That is the role of, that's one of the roles of the, roles of the priest. And he does a lot of diagnostic work, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> kind of hurts sometimes. Didn't realize that was an illness, Lord. Alright, third role. King. This is an interesting one because we live in a republic. <laughs> this is both the easiest to understand and the most difficult. Easy because we like having kings. We like having people in charge. You know, we want the perfect king to be in charge so our government will work appropriately. As a general rule, most people are willing to give power and authority to, to a capable leader. To a capable leader. Partly because a capable leader will make sure there's prosperity for everyone. But there's also, I believe, a bit of laziness <laughs> involved. Oh, the king's going to do it for us. We don't have to worry about maintaining peace and prosperity and justice and mercy in the land because the king's going to do it for us. We have someone appointed to that office, yep. and it's their job, and we pay them for it. All right, it. so the king's going to take care of all those big things. We're just going to focus on our own little corner, our own little kingdoms, and we're going to do the things that benefit us because the king has taken care of everything else. That is not how Jesus rules as king. <laughs> so as king, um, our author, I won't say isolates, but he talks about two different ways that Jesus is king. One is he's the son of God. He is God himself. And so as creator, sustainer, the world belongs to him and the universe is under his authority. That's kingship. But also, Jesus coming to earth and becoming human demonstrates a different kind of kingship. Because humans, when God made us, were supposed to be a ruler of the created world. We were supposed to be that interface between God and creation, and God would funnel through us. So, I guess we would be priests and prophets as well. Yeah. But we lost our divine authority when we fell. So when Christ became human and demonstrated his authority by obedience to the ultimate authority, God, mm -hmm. and carried that all the way through death and resurrection, that put him back in the position of ruler of creation as the perfect man, the perfect human being. So 
the authority that he demonstrates over creation is showing that he, as the God-man, is king over this world. This is touching back on a little bit what we talked about last week, mm -hmm. where Jesus was fulfilling the role that God gave to humans. Right. So he is fulfilling the kingly role that Adam and Eve were supposed to fulfill in the Garden of Eden, but failed to do. He is fulfilling our kingly role as being stewards of possessing the land, but we constantly fail to do. He does it. Does it perfectly with power and humility. So Christ as king is king. Most kings, all kings, but Christ, die eventually and their reign ceases and someone else takes over. But because Christ is risen from the dead, is immortal God, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, his reign continues forever and it continues to build. Yeah. And so we, underneath his reign, have an authority because we are his people, his ambassadors, his... Oh man, the word just totally faded out of my mind. Well, this, this is why that... Bass. <laughs> this is why we say that Jesus is sufficient and... Efficient? Well, no. no. <laughs> he just... Ah. Sorry. <laughs> Exclusive. Exclusive and efficient. Jesus is the eternal king. There is no heir coming after Jesus. In a human kingdom, if you don't like the king, you just wait for him to die and <laughs> have another heir come in to the throne. Maybe you could scheme behind the scenes to make sure your, the, one you want. the one you want gets on the throne. There's none of that with Jesus. He is eternal. Exclusive. There's not gonna. There won't be another king, and he's not gonna share his power with anybody else. He is sufficient. His kingship stretches across all of creation, both the physical and the spiritual, both in place and in time. Mm -hmm. There is nowhere you can go, mentally or physically or emotionally, in time or whatever, and get outside of his Where his he domain. Has been, his domain. Yeah. Excuse me. And this brings us to Pentecost. Pentecost. Whew. So, when Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to die and leave them behind, they were sad. Understandably so. <laughs> Jesus said, you should be happy that I'm about to leave you, because then, because when I leave you, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you. If I don't leave, then you're not going to receive the Holy Spirit, and that should make you sad. And on Pentecost, we see Jesus fulfilling his promise. In many ways, this is his ultimate fulfillment of his role as prophet, priest, and king, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, I like to make the observation that even though our book says Christ alone, that is kind of misleading, because Christ is not alone. He is part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So at Pentecost, we see... Jesus, his ultimate fulfillment as prophet, priest, and king by working within the Holy Spirit. Or sorry, working within the Trinity. By sending the Holy Spirit, we're seeing the fullness of God at work, fulfilling the role of prophet, priest, and king. Not just Jesus alone, but Jesus with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And this is a huge blessing for us because now we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, we assume the role of prophet, priest, and king. At Pentecost, you immediately see um, the apostles doing the things that Jesus did. You begin to see them work miracles, uh, heal people. Mm -hmm. You see them diagnose spiritual conditions. The book of Acts is just full of this. <laughs> you see Peter stand up right there in front of the people and say, Look, you misunderstood God and God's Messiah. Look at Jesus. Prophets pointed forward to Jesus to fulfill God's promise. The apostles pointed back to Jesus to say God's promise is fulfilled and judgment is coming on that basis. So Peter is being a prophet saying, Look at Jesus. 
You look through the book of Acts and people are always going, pray for me to the apostles. That is a purpose of the church. We are priests bringing the prayers of the people before God. Praying for the world. Praying for the church. And we have authority. Not as king, because as <laughs> Seth said, Jesus is exclusive. There's only one of him. But as ambassadors and stewards and vassals, the word I couldn't remember earlier, <laughs> each being entrusted with a small part of the kingdom to develop for our Lord so that when he comes he may be pleased. So ambassadors are ordained to carry the word of the king wherever they go. When they speak, they are speaking the words of the king. So ambassadors better make sure that when they speak, they're actually speaking the <laughs> words of the king. And they're not speaking out of self-interest or on behalf of some foreign interest. So we are given a great responsibility that should fill us with wonder and awe and a little bit of fear. Because <laughs> when we speak, even when we're driving in our cars on the highway or whether we're at home watching the news or wherever we are, we are always speaking as ambassadors of Christ. So we better be speaking as Christ speaks. We should be slow to anger, quick to forgive, abounding in love, because that is how Jesus spoke. That's his official policy, and we should represent it. <laughs> yes, we should. And as prophets, because ambassador crosses over into prophet, mm -hmm. we need to be sure that we are giving people the right understanding of God by our lives, by our actions, and by our words. And if we're not sure if we have the right understanding, then we need to devote ourselves to understanding God. Very often it's easy to consider that someone else's job, like maybe his job. <laughs> no. Um, you look at the New Testament and you see a lot of flawed people trying to be Christians. <laughs> But you also get the feeling that it doesn't just rest on the shoulders of a few. Uh, read Paul's epistles, and at the end, there's all these people who are doing exactly what Paul is doing. Planning churches, leading churches, teaching people, baptizing people. They're just not doing it on the grand scale that Paul did to, so as to be remembered by history. We are all appointed to the position of prophet, priest, and king to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. And this is a calling that transcends any other calling on our lives. It will bleed into every other calling on our lives. And so we need to recognize that at, that is first and foremost, we are developing our eternal natures <laughs> by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is that is a profound calling that we have. Mm. One that we're not going to be able to fully discuss just in a video. <laughs> we could talk on and on and on. So if you have any questions or concerns or like, wow, I just had this wonderful thought and I want to share it with somebody, please talk with a friend, neighbor, a pastor, a spouse, not only have we been given the Holy Spirit, we've been given the church. Brothers and sisters that we can talk with to help each other understand God's word better. To help each other walk the path faithfully. To help each other speak words of love and justice. <laughs> and also speak words of judgment. But a judgment that leads to repentance and eternal life. So, on that note, let us go before God as his representatives here on earth, knowing that by the power of the Holy Spirit, our words are carried up to heaven, where Jesus hears us and responds from the throne of God. Let us pray. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, Lord, I am humbled by what you have done for us and what you have made us to be. Lord, I pray that you'll fill us with your Spirit, filling us with the fruit of faith, hope, and love. And I pray that we can share these gifts with everyone around us. I pray, Lord, that you will hear our prayers, that we will be slow to anger, 
quick to love, not for our benefit, but for your benefit and for the benefit of your world. So Lord, I pray for the people of our country, our fellow citizens during this cold time. I pray, Lord, that your fire will kindle in the hearts of Americans everywhere so that we will turn from our selfish desires, that we will turn away from fear and anger and pain and embrace faith, hope, and love. Lord, in this season of transition, there are so many emotional responses, so many desires that feel unmet, uh, so many, so many causes for uncertainty. Remind us that ultimately our hope and faith are in you that you love us and that you are building your kingdom around us, that you are eternal and you are what never leaves. Remind us to put our trust in you first and ultimately and remind us that there in you there is peace. Holy God, I thank you that through your word you created heaven and earth. And I thank you that you have made us. You have given us a home and a family, a town, work, and a church. And I pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes that our small lives are part of a bigger creation. That we can look beyond our towns, look beyond our city, in our state, our country, and even our world, to see the immense cosmos that you have created and that you've made us part of. I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears so that we can hear that when we sing, we are singing with angels in heaven, and that we are singing the same song of praise. I pray, Lord, that with our eyes and ears open, we also have open hands to the people around us, bringing the glory and riches of your kingdom to the people of this world. So Lord, I continue to pray for our businesses, our farms, our homes. I pray for our schools, our police officers and firefighters. Pray for those who work in hospitals and in courthouses and in state houses. I pray for those who serve overseas Pray for those who serve in nursing homes. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the old and the young, the rich and the poor, that you'll be with those who are born and those who are unborn. May your spirit bind us all together as one people in your church. And let us pray as Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Quick note before we leave. Mm -hmm. Next week, we are combining three chapters into one week. <laughs> the topic is going to be the... Theories of Atonement. Theories of Atonement. How exactly does the cross work? There are many different ways. And next week, we're going to discuss, discuss a little bit of them all. So, until then, brothers and sisters, may the grace of Christ be with you all. Amen.